our first message for this season was titled, Why Giving is So Important. Giving is not just a financial matter, but it's a spiritual matter. And that's why it was the first one. When we look at the old, and we're not, that's not our, our message, but if you want to look at our, our message, if you want to learn about our, our, or hear our message on uh, why giving is so important, you can go to our Facebook page, and the messages is there, and we're not going to uh, reiterate everything that was last week, but we just moved in this morning as we think about this Christmas season. And uh, it's a spiritual matter. If you look at the old Levitical covenant, the first few, the first few chapters of the old Levitical covenant Start out with what? Finances. <laughs> with giving. I didn't write that. <laughs> the Lord wrote that. And so that's why it's so important. And think about it. A giving, a person that is a giver, that is a giver to God's work, it's a reflection of what lives in their heart. You can tell it. And you know, my wife and I were talking, we mentioned that I think even last service, that people that are giving people are very nice to be around. They're very nice to be around. Because they have a giving attitude and a giving spirit. And so that was the first service. Again, if you want to uh, uh, enjoy that service and learn more, more about that message, it's, or it's out there and you can access it. It's published out there for you. And of course, our message today is also spiritual. It's about honor. And honor is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's very <coughs> important in our relationship with Christ. It's very important in our relationship with God. And so we look here at uh, Matthew, the 10th chapter, and the 40th verse. Matthew, the 10th chapter, and the 40th verse. Matthew, the 10th chapter, and the 40th verse, and the 41st verse. It's in our bulletin, of course. And it says, the Lord Jesus, now these are the Lord Jesus' words. This is the words of our Savior. And so we pay attention, we pay attention to all of the words of the Holy Spirit. But this is the words of our Savior, the shepherd of our soul. He said, anyone who receives you, receives me. Now, he was talking to the disciples here. And he was telling them that, don't treat your presence among my children cavalierly. Because you represent me. And, that's, and so... This message was not only to his disciples, but it also is a message for us. That we don't treat God's servants cavalierly. They should not portray Christ cavalierly, nor should God's servants be received cavalierly. Oh, that's just, you know. No, that doesn't work that way. Go on here. This is spiritual. And anyone who receives me, receives the Father who sent me. So here's what Jesus is telling his disciples. Is that anyone that receives you, receives me. And anybody that receives Christ, receives what? The Heavenly Father. And he goes on in the 40th verse and says, If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as a prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. And so what the Lord was saying here, was that the Lord Jesus was saying is that disciples, carry yourself in a worthy manner. Because my, the, my sheep, they were not the disciples' sheep. They, uh, the, 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 the children of God that I serve are not my sheep. There's no minister on planet earth that has any sheep. Only Jesus has sheep. And the servants are picked by God. Well, hopefully Lord willing you're picked by God, right? Uh, and they're called to serve the Lord Jesus' sheep. And so what he's saying is that here, disciples, conduct yourself worthy to be respected by my sheep. And also, it's also a message to us that we respect God's servants. And value them because we know those servants represent Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ, of course, represents the Father. So, if we will honor this and we will conduct ourselves in this way, it's going to cause us to have, it's going to increase our faith and it's going to increase our freedom and the anointed one in the Lord Jesus. Look over here at Galatians, the fourth chapter and the 14th verse. Galatians. 
Galatians. Galatians, the fourth chapter, and the fourteenth verse. And you know, this is something that really is noteworthy. And this is the right attitude to have about God's servants. Uh, Galatians 4.14 And my trial which was in my flesh you did not despise or reject but you received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus. Now here the Galatians have a good testimony. Would you say that they followed what Jesus the Galatian congregation followed what Jesus taught in Matthew 10 which is read in 40.41 Would you say the Galatians followed that? Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. They followed it. <clears throat> they said that you received me even as Jesus Christ. Now, what really makes this outstanding, this situation with the Apostle Paul, because what does he say here? And my trial which was in my flesh. What does that mean? The servant of God had something going on. He had some difficulty that he was working through. And because the Apostle Paul had a challenge in his flesh, that that make the Galatian congregation disrespect him any. No, did not. They did not disrespect him. They valued him. They honored him. And the Galatians, therefore, as a congregation, provide an example of what the Lord Jesus taught here in Matthew 10. The apostle could write in the letter and say, you, you treated me like I was an angel of God, even like Jesus Christ himself. Boy, that's a good testimony, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a good testimony for the Galatian congregation. Let's look over here at Hebrews, the 13th chapter in the 17th verse. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and let's look at the 17th verse. Hebrews, the 13th chapter and the 17th verse. 13 and 17. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and the 17th verse. Hebrews 13 and 17. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and the 17th verse. Thirteenth chapter and the 17th verse. Now, these were directions that were provided on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey those who rule over you. Well, that's pretty conclusive. I don't think there's any ambiguity there, is there? That's pretty clear. And be what? Submissive! Can you imagine someone telling the Lord Jesus... I don't need you or you know I can read the Torah on my own or whatever it is at the time with the Torah of course that's not I, I can't imagine that obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your what for your souls true servants of God are watching out for the betterment of the children of God true servants of God are watching out for their betterment Why do you think the servant is going to say something? Is he going to say something trying to hurt you? A true servant of God is going to say something trying to bless you and try to prosper you and give you peace and give you joy. Amen? Mm -hmm. Praise God. <clears throat> and it says, as those who must give an account. So what does that mean? That means that the servants, yeah, it says, obey those who will over you and be submissive, for they watch over your souls, as those who must give an account. In other words, the servants of God are accountable to who? Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, Jesus Christ, he can take care of his business. And he will take care of it. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. What does that mean? In other words, the Galatian congregation, how they conducted themselves, is that they brought joy to the servants of God. 
They brought joy to them, not grief to them. For that would be what? Unprofitable for you. So I'm going to give you something to write down. What does that mean, unprofitable? When we are not in accord with this spiritual guidance here, we become unprofitable. What does this mean? That it means that they will miss out. Let me give you something to write down here. They will miss out on the fullness that God has to offer them. Those souls will miss out on the fullness that God has to offer them. They will miss out on the fullness that God has to offer them. Now let's go over here, let's look at Mark, the 10th chapter. And let's start at the 17th verse. Mark, the 10th chapter and the 17th verse. Mark, the 10th chapter, 17th verse. Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, and the 17th verse. Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, and the 17th verse. And it reads, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, this is somebody running after Jesus. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. I'm your father and your mother. 20th verse. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. 21st verse. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. You see, what happens when we're obeying, obedient to the Holy Spirit it draws us into a greater love relationship with God. Then Jesus looking at him, loved him and said, One thing you let, go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up your cross and follow me. 22nd verse, now this is the key verse here on this point. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, do you think that servant missed out on the fullness that God had for him? Oh, yes. Amen. What was God getting ready to do with that servant? He was calling him like he called the other what? Disciples. This man would have been what? One of the disciples of Jesus Christ. He would have been one of the founding members of the church. But the servant of God also known as the Lord Jesus, was ministering to him what to do with his money, and he wouldn't do what? He wouldn't what? He wouldn't listen. He walked away. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Oh, no. But what was God going to do? He was going to bless him abundantly. He could have learned the lesson from that little widow. Remember the Lord Jesus was in church one time? He was in the synagogue. Or the temple. And a lady there didn't have much money. She had two little mites. Let's say two pennies. And there were people that came by the offering box and put big, real big checks. Big amount of money. She put in two little pennies. And he said she put in more money than everybody else. And you know why? Because she gave 100% of what she had. That's all she had. She was living by what? Faith. Think the Lord Jesus did when he saw that. Do you think it moved him? No. You bet it moved him. Do you think he may have had a, now we don't know, but do you think he may have had a conversation with the disciples when he saw that? Look, when she leaves here today, make sure she's taken care of. Prosper her. She's working by faith. Isn't Jesus God? God in the flesh? He's going to minister to our knee. He saw her faith and he made an example and memorialized her in scripture. So, it's got, where, where is this, this rich young ruler? He didn't listen like that. He let money, money got him. And we, the Lord doesn't, having money is not a sin. Having lots of it is not a sin. But loving money is a sin. The love of money is the root of all evil, the Holy Spirit tells us. And so, this 
that, 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 that rich young ruler missed out on the fullness of God because he didn't listen. He didn't, he didn't do what this says here. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Did the rich young ruler do that? No, he did not. For they watch out for your souls. Wasn't Jesus watching out for his soul? Sure he was. Was the man going to become short in any way? No, God was going to make it up to him. As those who must give an account, let them do what they say with joy and not with grief. Now, was Jesus bothered by this? You bet he was. He was bothered by this. Because who told him to ask him to do that? The Father did. The Heavenly Father told him. Jesus said, I only say and do what the Father tells me to do and say. So here we got instruction to do this to this guy. It was a test. To see where his heart was. Was his heart with money? Or was his heart with God? Didn't Jesus already minister in Matthew? You can't love God and mammon or money? You're going to serve one or the other? Yeah, he already ministered that, right? Okay, let's look over here at 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter. And let's look at the 12th verse. 1 Thessalonians... 1 Thessalonians uh, and the uh, yeah, 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter and we'll look at the 5th uh, chapter, look at the 12th and 13th verse. 1 Thessalonians the 12th chapter and the 13th verse. 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter and the 12th and 13th verse. And it says 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter and the 12th and the 13th verse. And it says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. In other words, we realize those who, who labor in our midst. And we want to recognize that, it says here. The Holy Spirit says. And are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. 13th verse. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now think about it. Here the Holy Spirit is telling us our message this morning is honoring church leaders. Right? And so what he's saying is that we esteem those who serve us. We esteem our pastor. We esteem, esteem those who serve us. And ministry. We don't take it for granted what they do. And esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. In other words, they've been called by me, God would say. They represent me. If you don't treat them right, you don't treat me right. That's what God would say. Didn't Jesus just say that? If you receive them, you receive me. Right? People, I'm going to give you something to write down. People who will not receive the minister will not receive Christ. People who will not receive the minister will not receive Christ. Because who's the word going to come through? The minister. And if they won't receive the minister, they're not going to receive Christ. People who will not receive the minister will not receive Christ. Now I'm going to give you something else to write down. Second point here. Those who will not receive <coughs> Christ will not receive the minister. I'm going to give you a second point to write down here. Those who will not receive Christ will not receive the minister. Those who will not receive Christ will not receive the minister. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus told the disciples? Those who receive you receive who? Me. If they don't receive, wasn't that where, there's a record in the Gospels where the disciples went out and people would receive them. And what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? He said, shake the dust off your sandals. He said, and, and leave them. He said, more than that. Take my blessing with you. 
get take my blessing back up from there and take it with you as you go out the door. But that's a very stiff rebuke. The blessing of God is something that's coveted, that you want at, that you that you that you want. And that's how God looks at this. This is a spiritual matter. It's talking about honor. It's talking about growing close in our relationship with God. So people who will not receive the ministry will not receive Christ. And people who will not receive Christ will not receive the ministry. Because if you love God, you're going to receive the ministry. If you love Christ, you're going to do it. Because, you know, they represent Him. And what are they going to say? They're going to tell us something. Maybe it's something we don't want to hear. When you were growing up as a, and you had a mother and a father, a father and a mother, did they ever say anything you didn't want to hear? Could be. But guess what? If daddy tells you something, and if your spiritual mother, your pastor tells you something, guess what? It's for your benefit. You may not want to hear it, but it's going to bless you. I remember one uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this family had a child, and they loved to play video games. Oh, he loved video games. And he had a problem doing his homework, though. And the boy wanted to get the video game so bad. And, he, I, and I, I remember talking to him. He said, I ain't getting it. And I said, why are you going to get the video game? Because if I get that, he's going to play the thing all day and he ain't going to get his work. His, work, his homework going to suffer and stuff. I know him. I know my son. Now, do you think his son liked that? You think it made him real happy because he couldn't get the video game? No, he didn't like that. But was his father trying to look out for what was best? Yes, he was trying to bless him. Now, he may have cried and got upset because he couldn't get to play the video game. And there's some things that we may hear out of the Holy Spirit that, you know, it may be a challenge for us, but it's a blessing if we do it. Amen? Praise God. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching real good. I mean, man, get loud when I'm preaching good. So, we, we look at 1 Thessalonians 5th chapter here, 12, 13 verse. Our pastor needs, he needs to know that you're, uh, that if you've been helped by the ministry, he needs to hear that. It'd be very good for him to hear that. If we love our parents, isn't it good to tell them that we love them? And, and if they did something for us, that it helped us? Yeah, well, we have a spiritual parents too. We have a spiritual heavenly father and we have a spiritual mother. We know where our Heavenly Father is. Our spiritual mother is our pastor. And what do mothers do? What do spiritual mothers do? All they do is tell you what daddy said. <laughs> That's all they do. All spiritual mothers are water, they're water boys. They go to the Heavenly Father, load it up the pail, give me the water, and he throws the water on the, on the children. That's about it. That's all they do. But we do have a spiritual mother. Our spiritual leaders that we love them and that we support them, they need that. Just like God needs our love. This, aren't we taught to love God? Amen. We've got to show, we have to show that, that we support them and we love them. Let's look over here at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Wow. So much. Praise God. He's got so much. 1 Samuel, the 20, second chapter. Boy, there's so much. First Samuel, the second chapter, and we're going to look at the 30th verse. First Samuel, the second chapter, the 30th verse. Boy, there's so much this morning. That the Lord could share with us. First Samuel, the second chapter, and the 30th verse. Now, this text comes within the context of of the Lord dealing with the high priest, the pastor, the senior pastor of the church, the temple. And his name was Eli. And Eli was in a very anointed servant. But Eli had a weakness. In other words, he he played favoritism. And he didn't, he wouldn't sometimes call an Asa Asa speed. He would let things go on in God's house that was inappropriate. He wouldn't call people to account. You would call that today maybe being political or you would call it being, uh, you know, uh, a lackadaisical leader, if you will. I'm not trying to cast any aspersion on Eli. God bless him. He's in eternity. 
but he didn't take care of the affairs in God's house properly. He didn't watch over it. He allowed things to slip so that it was okay to do things that he had said not to do. And how do you think that went over with God? It did not go over very well. Now, did God come and warn Eli? Yeah, he did. He warned him. But Eli didn't listen to the warnings. Now, just because a man doesn't take care of his senior ministerial responsibilities, is that, gonna, is that a pattern for God? I mean, God won't take care of his business. God won't take care of his business. As a matter of fact, it ended up in tragedy for Eli and his children. They lost their lives. Because they just were, they wouldn't listen. God would tell them. So here's leading up to that. 30th verse. Therefore God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Is that what happened with Eli? Eli was already senior pastor. He was the high priest. You couldn't go anywhere. Father in the work of God at that time. That was the highest office you could hold. But did Eli lose this grace? Yeah, he lost it. And it cost him dearly. Because even as a, a senior pastor, he, he the honor wasn't in his heart. He didn't have tough conversations with people. That that's not appropriate. We can't do that. Sorry. I don't care if you're related to me. He had relatives that were involved in the ministry. He let them go. He wouldn't rein them in and correct them. Even family members. Let them run wild. Now, would he have lost some popularity if he had corrected some of his relatives like that? Maybe so. But guess what? They would have still been blessed. He would have been, and his children wouldn't have been taken out like, like what happened to him. So, we understand that Servants have responsibilities. God will hold them accountable. Eli was judged. He was ultimately taken out. By God himself. He'll put somebody else. Now God will give us chance after chance after chance. But there does come when the grace ends. God will say, that's enough. We've let him go long. We give him enough chances. That's it. And the boom drops. And his judgment. And it, it doesn't end pretty. So I'm going to give you something else to write down here. Without honor. Without honor. We will lose the favor of the Lord. On our life. Without honor. We will lose the favor. Of the Lord. On our life. Without honor. We'll lose the favor of the Lord. On our life. Praise God. God is good. Let's look over here. I'm going to give you um, a couple of examples here. Let's look over here at Philippians, the second chapter, and the 25th verse. Let's go to Philippians in the New Testament. And we're going to look at Philippians and... The second chapter of 25th verse, and we're going to close on these. We just got this so much this morning. We could go on for a long time this morning. The Lord has really provided bountifully for us this morning. But we've got to close up. Philippians, the second chapter, and we'll look at the 25th verse. The second chapter and the 25th verse. Now, this is uh, Epaphroditus. He was a servant in God's work. But we're going to use him as an example this morning. And then we're going to look at an Old Testament example as we close up this morning. I work on closing here. Okay. Philippians, the second chapter and the 25th verse. We're going to start there. Go for a few verses. As you like, considered it necessary to send to you Aphrodite, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier. This is Apostle Paul talking here. But your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, 
and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I send him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in his hand. Now this is the Apostle Paul writing the congregation here at Philippi. I'm sending you a servant. And he has great concern for you. I'll hold him in esteem when he comes. When you esteem somebody, you value them. You respect them. Amen? Praise God. Now let's look over here. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's look at 1 Kings. And we're going to look at the 17th chapter. First Kings in the 17th chapter. And we're going to look at the 8th through the 15th verse. 17, 8 through 15. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. First Kings, the 17th chapter, the 8th through the 15th verse. In the 41st verse of our message text, it says, If you receive a prophet as one who speaks of God, you'll be given the same reward as a prophet. Well, Elijah was a great prophet. So let's look at one of the prophet's rewards here. Reward of, of, a, of a prophet, of honoring church leaders and a prophet reward. Let's start at the, uh, what did I say, the 8th verse? The 8th verse. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now here, the Lord is telling the prophet, I've got a widow who's going to give you money and take care of you. That's what he told him. Now, do you think this made Elijah really particularly happy, if you could say? Maybe not, maybe, maybe not. But does that matter? It doesn't matter. The only thing matters is you do what the Lord says do. That's what a blessing is. That's what a peace and joy is. I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks, that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. There was a famine in the land. It was a, a really harsh depression. So what does the world say? Well, you know, finances are bad. Let me cut back on my giving to God. You know, you got to take care of yourself, me, myself, and I. Is that what the Lord is telling, is teaching here? No. That's worldly thinking. That is not kingdom of God thinking. Right? That's why our text last service was, our emphasis last Sunday for the first message of Christmas season was, it's more blessed to give than receive. Yeah, we know why. Another example of that. So he said, as the Lord, uh, 12th verse, so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have bread, only a handful of flour in a bed, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. 13th verse, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it, what? First. Don't go in and feed your child and then give the servant of God what's left. No, you're going to... Uh, my, the word of the Lord that I like... Is Elijah... Is he ministering to her? Yeah, he's ministering to her need. Remember what Jesus said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All your supply will be provided. Remember, he said, I already instructed a widow to do this. She has needs, so what did God instruct the widow? I'm going to send a minister to you, a prophet to you, and when you, he gets here, bless him. Isn't that what he told her? Told her? 
water shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. 15th verse. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for what? Many days. <clears throat> uh, theologians say this is probably a year or more. The bent of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So God was using the servant of God here. If her mind had become corrupted and she would not be obedient to the word of the Lord, she would lose out. She would have lost out. She would have indeed died in that famine. If she said, no, I can't do that. I, you know, got to be me and mine first, you know. That is not her, her, her attitude. You can tell this lady loved God. And because she loved God and was obedient to him. So the story is she loved God. She did what she was told. And it was an utter disaster. And she starved out and died. That's how, that's how the story ended. No. She prospered and was blessed. And ate many days. Until the economic situation turned around. It's the same thing with us as God's children. Children of God. God wants us blessed. And what is God teaching us here in this morning God is teaching us that he wants us to operate in an honor relationship with him. When we honor something, we value it. When we honor something, we respect it. We esteem it. The Phrodites, the, uh, 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 how uh, the Zarephath widow treated Elijah. We have other examples, right? And this morning, and so as we think about those examples that God set for us, we hold fast to them. He who receives you receives me. And anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as a prophet. And if you receive righteous because righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given reward like theirs. And so that their fifth widow was able to receive a prophet's reward. Supply that one little that one little offering provided a whole year of sustenance. And not only did she live above it, the prophet lived above it as well. And so, and so, as God's children, we realize that we want to honor God. We know that as we honor Him and value Him, that's going to lead to a place of peace and joy and prosperity in every area of our life.